Good evening and welcome to the AC's International Observer Moon Night. Uh, before we start, I'd like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. And we pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Uh, tonight, the ASV is proud to bring you our live stream, International Observe the Moon Night. Uh, as always, if you're enjoying tonight's stream on Facebook, you can donate stars. If you're on YouTube, you can donate stickers. All donations, no matter how large or small, are welcome. And if you're watching us for the first time, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and like our page on Facebook. Uh, we hope you enjoy tonight's stream. And I would like to make you aware that, as usual, being in Victoria, we are dodging some clouds. So we apologise in advance uh, if you are unable to see the moon. And before we begin streaming the moon, I'll bring in the team uh, that is going to be helping us stream tonight. And then we're going to announce the winner of our photography com competition, of our moon photography competition. So we have uh, Lee with us tonight. We have Good evening. Barry. We have Andy. We have our Hi. planetary section director, Stuart Beveridge, with us. We have Steve Thurn. Evening, everyone. With us as well. And we have Gerald from Big Central, who's going to be announcing Hello. the prize. So, Gerald, I think what we're going to do straight up is hand over to you. So well, if you'd like to, uh, the pressure's on you now to, to make somebody very happy, well, make two people very happy. Two people happy, yeah. Uh, and everyone else will come for you. <laughs> so over to you now, Gerald. Okay, to me. Um, thank you to everyone. There was some amazing, amazing photographs that I had to look through the past few days. Um, yeah, just some very creative shots and some very precise technical stuff. So there's two categories. The first category I'm going to look at was the create creativity uh, aspect of the of the um, the competition. So I'll get straight into it. The winner is uh, what's her name? Kylie McKay. She um she did this shot. I don't know if you can actually get this mark, but um to share your screen. I'll try to share. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I chose this shot purely because it was um to me it was it's nothing like I've seen before. It's um it, it to me it was um uh, quite a moody shot and um having that rainbow too it was you know emphasized it's been raining and um and still getting the, the moon i thought that was quite a quite well composed and um yeah i enjoyed that so this that, that was a clear winner so this is for our membership this is the one year membership yeah that's right this is for us. so kylie mckay uh if you could send us a message we'll, we'll make an announcement as well on our facebook page um, and we'll organise and set up a membership for you uh, in the coming days. Uh, so that's a one-year membership to the Astronomical Society of Victoria. And who was the winner of the binoculars? The binoculars? Um, all right. Um, I'll share my screen again. Um, So this uh, was a photo from Raf Ser Serrano. Okay, let's get that one up. Here we go. Um, I think this is an incredible shot. I mean, for me, it's um, it's captured so much detail, so much contrast, and it's also picking up the the colours that um, of the minerals on the moon. So for me, that's technically a clear winner, and um, I think a well-deserved winner of the the binoculars. Right, there we go, Raf. We'll um, we'll tag you in your in the post, and uh, if you could send us a message, we'll ensure um, make sure we can get those binoculars out to you. Yeah. So to everyone else, I mean, there were some great there were some great photos that were submitted. And, um, yeah, it was quite hard to um, to pull the winner, but um, you know, I went back and forth with a couple, but this one kept 
So I think this this photo here by Raph was one that, would, to me, stood out. We'll pop that back up for a second. It is a very nice photo, very well composed, well taken as well. There we go. It is. It's a very impressive photo, this one, that's for sure. I like our, even outside of the sort of the mineral colouring yes. further down, the fact that you've got um, – the craters with the um the ejector lines yeah are really quite um quite highlighted very sharp very sharp very good photo now i think we might actually have a little bit of cloud uh just for the moment so what i'm going to do is just i'd like to explain a little bit about the moon and if anyone has any questions um, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them as best we can. Um, so as an introduction to the moon, the moon is 3,476 kilometres across. Uh, it's about one quarter the diameter of Earth and is the fifth largest moon in the solar system. It doesn't even get the title of the largest moon. Uh, the moon orbits the Earth every 27.5 days, which is a sidereal month, at an average distance of 384,000 kilometres. Uh, the orbit is slightly elliptical with the minimum distance perigee at 360,000 kilometers and the maximum distance apogee at 400,000 kilometers. It spins on its axis at the same rate as it revol revolves around the Earth, hence why, why we always see the same face of the Moon. The most likely origin of the Moon is a giant impact where a Mars sized planet smashed into the young Earth, forming a cloud of debris in near Earth orbit, which eventually coalesced to form the moon. The moon rocks returned by Apollo astronauts show us the moon has existed for about 4.6 billion years. Um, a full lunar phase cycle takes 29.5 days. And due to that fact, the Earth is also moving, uh, uh, due to that fact, the Earth is also moving around the sun and the moon is currently in its waxing, is it waxing gibbous phase? Oh, that might not be right. Correct. Yeah, that's it correct. Is, it, is it, is, it is waxing gibbous. It is waxing gibbous. I got Sorry, I was on mute. myself for a second there. Uh, and a new moon when the moon lies between Earth and the sun's rays. Uh, so we see, we all see, so all we see is the un, unilluminated side of the moon. Uh, the full moon is when the full when the moon lies on the far side of the Earth and the sun's rays. So we see it fully illuminated. At full moon, the moon rises in the east at the same time as the sun sets in the west. And with a waning moon, after full moon, when the moon lies off to the side of Earth and the sun's rays, each day we see a shrinking gibbous moon followed at last quarter by a shrinking crescent moon as it heads towards new moon. Now, ah, oh, look at that. We have a live feed. Ooh, look at that. So this is from Andy's. Um, this is Andy. Andy's over near the South Australian border. Now, Andy, you can't zoom what? in on that at the moment, can you? No, not not at the moment. I've just got one camera in, but um, I'll, I'll get my other one in. I've got a, my, I've got my guide scope. That's my guide scope. I can sort of zoom in on that, but it's not the clearest thing. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll get my other camera on in a minute. Um, yeah, it's. It's in and out of cloud, of course, like normal. But <laughs> she's gone straight behind now. We did we did mention to uh, the viewers that we'd be battling cloud, so we were hoping to uh, have a look at Copernicus, the crater Copernicus first up. Um, so, Steve, I might see if you want to have a chat about uh, Copernicus, even though we're not we can't quite see it at the moment. Well, how, what about? Um... Instead of doing Copernicus, we could perhaps talk about the uh, the the Murray, the seas, which yes. we can. So the dark patches. Yes, um, let's let's do that. Oh, actually, no, let's go there because Noel's got Copernicus. He's going to share his screen in a second for us, and you'll be able to jump into Copernicus. Oh, bear with us. Here he comes. Ah, oh, there we go. There we go. Look at those ejector rays. Uh, right on cue. Yeah. So the the reason we so Copernicus is one of the uh, the younger craters on the uh, on the the moon, uh, 
uh, it was formed in the Copernican period. So that period of, uh, of crater development on, uh, on the moon is named after Copernicus. So uh, it's one, one of the younger craters. So they think it was formed around 900 million years ago. So about a billion years ago. So most of the crater activity on the moon predates Copernicus, which has happened 900 million years ago. That's a really good picture of it. You can see the, uh, the mountain, uh, two mountains in the center of Copernicus. So, so, so Copernicus is 93 kilometers uh, across. And just to give you an idea of, uh, so that's a sort of a horizontal scale idea, a little bit of sort of vertical scale. So the, the, the surface uh, of the crater down in the middle is um, 3,750 metres below the rim. Uh, so, and the central mountains that you can see, the two there, are 1,000 metres high. Uh, they don't look it, do they? They look like just little little pimples, but they're a, they're a thousand meters high. So uh, you know, heading for sort of half the height of uh, of the highest mountains in Australia. Um, so um, I don't know if we can uh, see as well. Um, the, uh, if you zoom out a little bit. Can we see uh, the keyhole-shaped crater? Cr um, cr I get my teeth in. The keyhole-shaped crater. Oh, there it is. You can see it just below. Can you see? I don't know if you can point. Uh, that little keyhole crater uh, is called Fauth. F A U T H. Uh, so those are really good images that we're that we're getting. I know uh, last year uh, when we were. Uh, uh, doing the International Observing the Moon Night. We couldn't get to this sort of uh, quality of uh, resolution. It's really good. Um, um, apparently, the um, so, so another little fact uh, about uh, Copernicus, um, there was a, a, a picture uh, taken by uh, the uh, Lunar Orbiter, uh, Lunar Orbiter 2, uh, in 1966, all those many moons ago, uh, when I was, how old would I have been? Nine. I was nine. Um, and, it, and what it did was it took a, a picture at a sort of an oblique angle um, across uh, Copernicus. Uh, and uh, apparently it was regarded as being the picture of the century. Uh, for the 20th century. So the Lunar 2 orbiter was flying at about 130 kilometers above the surface when it took the picture. Um, I don't know if we've got, I might, uh, I might try and, uh, I've got a picture of that, but I might try and uh, fish one out and we can show it in a little while. I might see, uh, Barry, if you've got anything you'd like to add to the uh, information about Copernicus that Steve shared with us. There you go. You're, you're right to talk now, Barry. Okay, yeah. I've got a picture of it, um, if I could share that. Um, yeah, by all means, share away. We can pop that up. Where's the... Um, little share button down the bottom, little plus. Yep. And while we've got that, while we're waiting for that to come up, Andy's got a, an image of the Apollo. That's not Apollo it. Apollo 11. Oh, hang on. We'll jump back. We'll come back to Andy's in a second. Whoop. No, we'll go back. Barry's still trying to share his screen. You'll have to uh, share the window you want to share. So, Andy, do you want to tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here? Now, yeah, we're actually looking at the the landing vehicle, the Eagle, um, which was uh, landed in 1969. Um, and that's the base of it. The The top part of it has actually left and docked on. Now, this, this is not taken from Earth. It, it's taken from one of the um, orbiters, which orbit the moon. And it's a it's just a program anyone can download. But you can even see the footprints where they walk to the crater. Uh, I can't remember what crater this was called. Um, 
they walked to the crater, they walked around here. But quite clearly, you can see this. Um, but these were taken oh, probably 100 kilometres up, if that, probably even closer. Um, so zoomed out, I will zoom out in the area where you can see in the Sea of Tranquility. Is it coming out a bit more? Right on the edge. So it's, anyone can look at this. It's called um, Moon Trek. You just look for Moon Trek. It's a, um, it's a NASA. And it's, it's a whole database of all their images they've taken. And you can do different layering. You can actually get gravity layers. Um, yeah, I, I love this. And it's also Mars as well. But And the details you can get. Um, but you can't see this from Earth. But anyway, um, that's a program you can play with sometime. Um, you can see the brilliant details of craters. It just takes a while. I'm in my tent, so I'm not getting really good internet at the moment. So it's, it'll take a while for these <laughs> images to load, and they're they're pretty intensive. But you can, you know, you can. And I've searched everywhere, and I haven't found any um, crazy alien structures yet. So no, I've no alien structures yet. Hours in this. Except for the bit which NASA won't show you. But... <laughs> I <I'm gonna laughs> haven't turned any golf gonna... balls or hammers. I'm going to jump over to Barry's uh, screen because Barry wanted to chat a little yep, bit more sure. about Copernicus and we've got his photo up. So, Barry, take it away. Is that photo up for everyone? It is, yes. yes we can see it. Yep. Mm. Yep. I think it's, it's hard to understand, but if, if you stand in the flat part of the many of the craters on the moon and look towards the horizon, the actual mountains that form the crater are below the horizon. And that's due to the, the, the curvature of the moon itself. Now, I'm not quite sure whether that applies to Copernicus because those mountains look very, very high. But mm. um, many of the other craters like Plato, etc., cetera, are, are filled up with uh, a lava plain um, you just can't see the crater itself by, by anyone standing in the middle. Um, the walls are so far away um, that the, the curvature of the moon drops them out of sight. The peak in the middle of Copernicus, you can see, is, um, is not just a simple peak like you see a drop of water coming out of the, the sink. Um, it's, 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 um, it's a very complex central peak and uh, I guess it's an indication of the uh, catastrophic collision but um, I haven't got a lot more to add about Copernicus um, it, it's probably probably the, in, in the top five most prominent um, features on the moon as far as craters go and um, if it clears up we'll be able to see it live <laughs> Hey, Mark, I've, uh, uh, Barry, I've found uh, uh, the, the picture of the century which uh, on yep, uh, yep. on the map, which uh, I can kind of show. I think it kind of demonstrates what you were saying, Barry, uh, which uh, is that you can't really see just how high the edges of the crater are, even though obviously the this picture of the century wasn't taken from the surface. It was taken from 130 kilometres up. So let's... Let me just see if I can uh, um, find uh, find it. Those images uh, before from was it Andy? Uh, yes. Of the of the footprints and the lander that was from the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter of 2016, that took um, very high resolution images of the Moon, and it was in a um, uh, an orbit that brought it down to 200 meters above the surface. Two, yeah, that's why. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's why you can't see it from Earth. Yeah. I think Can one you... pixel, even off the Hubble, one pixel is over it's hundreds of metres. You know, one pixel will not, the resolution won't won't get pick up. Um, I, think it's, I think it's easy, 100 square metres, 100 by 100 square metres minimum. Um, yeah, so, yeah. That's why it's blurry. That's why you won't see pick anything up. Mark, I've sh I've shared that image. I don't know whether you can bring it up or not. There we go. 
So uh, what's, what I find amazing about this picture is that it was taken in 1966. So uh, um, it's a, it, I can understand why it was seen as being the picture of the century at the time. Apparently this is not the original, it's a sort of a, a one that's been worked on a little bit, but you can actually see the, the sort of bands, how the picture was put together as sort of bands of, uh, um, of image that they've sort of uh, stitched together. Uh, amazing. But uh, the, the edges, that obviously, of the crater don't really look that high. You know, when you think that there's a, a difference of, uh, what did I say, 3,750 metres uh, from the bottom of Copernicus to the, to the, uh, the rim. Truly amazing. That that also would have been it's quite an impressive um, image for when it was well, taken. Out. Right, so we're jumping across now to well, Tycho. There we go. I'm gonna throw that one back to you again, Steve, to kick off on. <laughs> Uh, sure. Um, so Tycho is just a mere baby of a crater uh, in terms of its age. Um, it's uh, about 100 million years old. So Copernicus was, uh, what did I say, 900 million years old. Tycho uh, is about 100 million years old. And I think what's, uh, what people will know about that, so it's a little bit smaller than Copernicus. It's... Uh, what is it? Uh, Eighty-five kilometers across. But but the thing that um, I think people, when they look up at the moon, you can. Um, I think you can see this with the naked eye, as obviously with binoculars. Is the uh, at full moon you can really see all of the ejector rays that that come out from uh, uh, Tycho and and spread about half a half a way across the. Uh, uh, the surface of the moon in in all directions. It's a really spectacular sight. It's one of the things you know. Obviously, in, when you're looking at a the full moon, um, a lot of the detail is washed out. But what the the brightness of the full moon does bring out is the ejector rays of uh, of Tycho. It's uh, really quite spectacular. Um, so uh, it's, uh, I mean, the, the floor of Tycho is about five kilometers below the rim. So it's actually a bit deeper uh, than uh, Copernicus. And that little pimple in the middle is actually 1600 meters high. Um, yeah. Now, there is a question, and I'm not sure whether we're able to answer it. Nico is asking, how do they work out how old they are? Um, not I sure think what they, answer that one. I know I can't. No, I, th I mean, I'll defer to uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know if Stuart or Barry know, but I think what they've done over the, over the years is to kind of work out how craters sit on top of one another. So you've got like yeah. the very early craters uh, and then they overlap one another and overlap one another. Sorry, Barry, go on. Yeah, I was going to say much the same thing. There are there appears to be almost no young craters inside um, Tycho, and um, that, that's a clear indication that it's pretty young. I think if if you do um, if you could build up a a, a catalogue of um, uh, craters and overlaps of craters, you could eventually work out a, a timeline and. Um, on that timeline, probably Tycho would sit right up at the um, at, at the most at the, the latest end of it. Hmm. So we do have another question as well, and this is probably the the crater to look look at to answer this one. Can we explain what ejector rays are and what causes it? Oh, the ejector rays are. Um, material that's been ejected from the collision in a almost horizontal direction by uh, the sheer blast of the um, of the formation of the crater and um, they travel at such high velocity with such high energy that they carve 
uh, a little furrow across, well, a big furrow across the surface of the moon. And uh, they're most evident. You can actually see them in that picture off to the right of, of Tycho. Uh, you, you can point to them, probably Mark, but I can't. Yeah, the, around there, there's, there's evidence of streaks that you can see um, probably radiating from Tycho itself. So, Noel, I'm just wondering if um, you're able to maybe turn the brightness up a little bit to see if that makes the ejector appear a bit more prominently or the gain exposure. Not sure of the tech. There we go. Oh, oh too much. Too much. <laughs> Out there. So you can really see them there now. You can really see those lines. Yeah, perfect. As opposed to what we've just been saying, below Tycho in that picture is the is the crater Clavius. And Clavius is thought to be the second largest crater on our side of the moon. But you can see on, inside it, there's a, um, a parade of, uh, of other craters, so that indicating that Clavius is quite, a, quite an old crater and that um, there's a couple of craters on the rim and then um, that big arc of craters getting smaller and smaller to the to the left. So Clavius would be quite an old crater. Um, off the top of our heads, it would be difficult to actually put an age on it, but it's much, except to say it's much, much older than Tycho. So do yeah, we, I, I was just going to say, do we have any understanding of where those uh, crater hits have come from? What direction they may have have come from, or is it not something that we were able to tell? I was only understanding that that arc of craters, and and there's others similar on the moon as well, and other and other moons is a um, is a rapid collision of, um, of pieces from the same uh, object that may have partly broken up on its travels to the moon, and it's um, sort of almost like a machine gun. Um, uh, parade of, uh, of collisions but um... I think I think the good news for us uh, living now is that there isn't as much stuff floating around the solar system as there would have been uh, 100 million years ago um, and uh, so the you know the the number of uh, we just don't really see new large craters forming on the moon now. It's really just uh, very small uh, uh, yeah. objects. Um, you know, all the um, the significant activity that formed these craters is really in in past history. And you know, obviously, uh, Tycho is about a hundred million years ago. Most of the activity that created the uh, the early craters, the really big ones, the the, the dark ones, the Marae, uh, occurred about four billion years ago. So when um, the solar system was really just forming. Getting back to the um, getting back to the question about the the angle of the collision, I think if the angle is very oblique, the crater actually comes out to be um, elliptical. But if you study a, a, a what, what appears to be a round crater, it's probably um, not, not as symmetrical as you may think. And there might be a deep end or a deep part on one side or more more build up of the mountain on one side than the other. And that would indicate that the, um, the collision was not uh, perpendicular to the surface. Mark, whose who's image is this? Because this looks this is, spectacular. This is live from Noel's um, equipment. This is up in Bendigo. So Noel, Noel, this is, Noel, this is spectacular. Yeah, this is, this is the only clear sky we've got at the moment, so we're rolling with it. So I think we might try and jump up to um, Sea of Tranquility next, if we can. We'll have a bit of a chat about uh, the most famous sea or mare. I said it right, Steve. Are you proud? Well done. <laughs> uh, you can you can call them mares if you want to. I, I I'm okay with that. I do like calling them mares. It sounds a little bit uh, GGs. A little bit of fun. Was issue earlier. That was Amory's issue earlier. Chasing I, I horses, horses around escaped. the paddocks. <laughs> 
So there we go. We have live. We have uh, astrophotographers with equipment all all over Victoria. Uh, one of those being Anne Marie, who's uh, sort of out Castlemaine, Molden Way, and, and instead of being able to set up her gear for tonight, she was chasing horses that had escaped their paddocks. So we have all kinds of issues when we go for live stream. And there you go, Noel. Margie says thanks for sharing Noel. Fantastic view. <laughs> So just to give you a um, a bit of a uh, one one is are we with, we're on Knowles, aren't we? Are we on Knowles? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the uh, Murray term qualitatis is the, uh, the the large C uh, just sort of left of centre in the image there. The the Murray that's above it is uh, the uh, Sea of Serenity Murray Serenitatis. And the virtually round Murray, uh, just over to the uh, on the right of the image, there is uh, Murray Christian. Um, now, um, so that uh, just uh, uh, for those that sort of don't know what the Murray are, as I said earlier on, they're, they're um, very, very old uh, impact basin craters uh, that go back um, about. Uh, uh, between three and 4.3 billion years. That's when all of the marais were formed. Um, and very early days with uh, the moon when it was still uh, quite a sort of a volatile, molten sort of uh, uh, object. Um, uh, so what happened was that uh, a large meteor would have impacted uh and form that huge great crater, which then almost immediately flooded with uh, molten lava, uh, a basaltic lava. That's why it has a sort of a, a, a dark colour. If you think of the rock basalt uh, here on Earth, it's, it's almost black, uh, sort of dark grey colour. And it's the same sort of thing on, on the Moon. Um, interesting thing as well is that it was very fluid, so it had the viscosity of motor oil. Um, so it was able to flow very, very rapidly uh, to fill the, uh, the crater. Uh, and so um, a lot of the sort of the detail uh, inside the crater uh, was lost with this sort of flow of, of lava uh, across. Um, but um, the, um, of course, the Mare Tranquillitatis, the Sea of Tranquility, is probably most famous as being the place where man stepped foot on the moon for the first time with Apollo 11. And uh, in this uh, image, uh, the, the area of the Sea of Tranquility where they landed is in the sort of the lower left uh, part of, uh, of, of, this, of, the, uh, of the crater. Um, I don't know whether um, you can... Uh, Sort of point out, Noel, where where that is in that sort of uh, lower left, not quite, not into that little bottom bit that sort of goes away, just uh, up uh, up a little yeah, bit. Right. Right. Where the bright dot is, that's a great way of describing it. Can we see where the lunar lander landed? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm just getting in. I'm just getting in early. Uh, we do have a question about the lava flows. Did the lava flow from inside the moon or from an impact object? So was it uh, was the moon volcanic when that lava flow occurred, or was it from something yeah. else? So it's from the inside of the of the moon, as you, as you put it there. So I, I would have anticipated that uh, the actual meteor itself, a lot of the meteor would have would have sort of exploded away in. Uh, the ejector rays like we have with the, the young craters like uh, Tycho. But, you know, if you look at the scale of, uh, of uh, the Sea of Tranquility, it must have been a very, very violent episode. Um, and um, you wouldn't have wanted to be very close to it. I think I might have a question for Barry from one of our viewers. Raf, who is our um, binocular winner, Congratulations, Raf. Glad to have you on the stream. How come there are circular craters on the side of the moon facing Earth? Shouldn't Earth block any objects coming that way? 
Well, I think um, for a start, something hitting the moon wouldn't come straight in. It would come in a curved trajectory. It would have been influenced by the moon's gravity itself as it got close. So um, also something coming from the direction of the Earth, the Earth may, in fact, um, it's, the Earth's gravity may, in fact, focus the object into hitting the moon. Uh, I think the, from a collision point of view, the Earth would represent quite a small um, impedance to the to, to, to the uh, flow of these objects. So I, yeah, I, I don't I don't think it would make a lot of difference. There we go. Hopefully that answers your question, Raf. <clears throat> Stuart, do you have anything to I add about uh, the uh, Sea of Tranquility there? To do anything to do with the Apollo missions, perhaps? Uh, no, just going on um, uh, what Barry said, um, I don't think the Earth would have impeded any objects coming in, but um, the Moon at the moment is locked into its... Um, also, it's locked into its orbital um, uh, rotational uh, view where we only see, the one, uh, only see the one side, but it might not have necessarily always been that way until uh, it uh, reached the... Uh, synchronous uh, orbit that it is today yeah hopefully we've been able to answer those questions that's the... i don't think we've got any others no question no other questions at the moment so if it's possible and we might move to the apennine mountains if we can No pressure. No pressure, Noel. No pressure at all. I know Anne-Marie's got her scope up and running as well now. I might just jump across to Anne-Marie's quickly while we're... Yeah, Mark, if you want to uh, go and share uh, my screen again, I've got a very famous uh, picture from uh, Apollo 11. Oh, is that uh, the one that was filmed in, that are taken in Hollywood by Stanley Kubrick? It certainly was, yeah, yeah. Yes, can you? I don't know if you can share that one up. I have already in a Hollywood basement. Okay, yeah. so this is um, this is uh, a picture that, of Buzz Aldrin. So it's not Neil Armstrong. Uh, well, it's actually both of them, because what's really other than the fact that it's a really great sharp picture, um, what what you can see in in Buzz Aldrin's visor, you can actually see a reflection of. Neil Armstrong in the middle, and also the the eagle, the lunar lander, uh, reflected in the visor of uh, Buzz Aldrin's spacesuit. It's just a, a, an amazing picture. It also uh, proved once and for all that the Mare Tranquillitatis uh, was not a sea. So they are not paddling in water. They are uh, jumping around in the... Uh, in the regolith on the surface of the moon. We'll jump back across to Amory's quickly here. So I'm trying to work out where we are on there with that. I think we're still near. Uh, oh, we're near Serenity yep, and Tranquility. I believe. Looks to me like that's where we are. So I might the Apennine be Mountains are top right. Ah, oh, they are too. There we go. On the money, Anne-Marie. On the money. So we might have a chat about the uh, the Apennine Mountains, the mountain range. I know they're named after the Italian mountains, the Apennine Mountains in Italy. And have you been there? Huh? Sorry? Have you been to the uh, Apennine? Up, no. Apennine no, oh, up, up Anne-Marie. Oh, yeah, there we go. Bang on the money. No, I haven't. I'd love to, though. I really would love to. They're quite, quite beautiful, these ones. I'd like to go to these ones as well one day if we could. But the, it's interesting because the, um, the uh, Montes Apenninas um, are um, so much higher than anything that we've got in Australia. So uh, they're about um, uh, 5,000 metres 
tall. The tallest part. Uh, so what, what have we got? We've got just over 2,000 meters with Kosciuszko. Uh, so they're, they're actually more akin to the mountains that you would see in Europe, particularly, say, the Alps, which go up to that sort of height. So they're a significant uh, range of mountains. Uh, my notes say that uh, the mountain range is about 250 kilometers long. Um, I'm not sure about that, actually. I thought they were a bit longer. Um, well, while you, you um, confirm that, I'm not sure. I'm hoping Amber might be able to, or somebody might be able to. Justin wants to know what scale are we looking at here? How many kilometres across the screen? So if the mountains are meant to be about 250 kilometres there, and they're taking up probably almost half of that view there on the left hand side. That would make the width of that screen there what close to 600 kilometers across. And that, that for some reason, that was yeah, a figure that I was thinking. I feel like that's not right. I feel like it's wider than that. Well, the, 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 the bright crater, which is Aristoteles, is um, what, so 87 kilometers wide. So, uh, I'm, I'm thinking we're looking at more at 600 kilometers rather than 250, aren't we, for the for the range? Yeah, and I think the width of that view there, we're probably looking close to a thousand kilometers across. Yeah. Yeah, even more. Maybe more. Yep. 1200. 1200. There we go. Around about 1200 kilometers across the current view that we've got now, approximately. Uh, we have another question from Rebecca on YouTube. Wants to know how long will it take for the moon to break away from Earth's gravity and venture off into space? Yeah, the, the dynamics of celestial objects is incredibly complicated. And a simple answer is that it may never do so. It may actually collide with the Earth rather than disappear. But. Um, it's all to do with um, uh, maintain uh, what do you call it? Uh, maintenance of, uh, of momentum and kinetic energy and the rest of it. At the moment, the moon is actually slightly moving away, is it? Or have I got that right? Yeah, uh, yeah. something like three centimeters a year yeah. or something. Yeah. Two or like three that. centimeters a year. That's right. But it, yeah. it doesn't mean that it will, it will do that forever. And there are mm. also um, perturbations from other planets um, in the solar system that have an influence on the movement of the Earth, of the moon around the Earth. And so to predict its actual motion uh, millions or even billions of years down the, down the track is, is, in, is incredibly complicated. But um, it may never break away from the Earth. Well, I kind of hope not because I love getting out and imaging it. It's great fun. Uh, here's another one. Not sure we can answer this one, but we'll give it a go. Hi, all. Is there still much research happening with respect to the moon? And could you share any upcoming projects, missions planned, if any? I believe there was one announced today to do with uh, Australian Space Research and NASA. Something along yeah, those lines. Yeah, um, there's a moon buggy um, that was announced yeah. today from Australia that's... Um, are going to be, I, I don't know, know too much about it, but um, in cohorts with NASA, there's a, a new um, a moon a little uh, buggy that's uh, going to go up to the moon, but I'm not sure exactly when. I, I'd have to go back and reread the article. So, yeah, that's, that's about the only one that I know. I know China's got some stuff happening up there. Not exactly sure on the um, details. It's um, something in the order of 2026. For the, for yeah, the, um, for the Australian, yeah, Australian rover. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's correct, yeah. For those who are interested in their Apollo facts, Apollo 15 landed uh, in fairly close to the uh, Apennine Mountains. Uh, so in this image that we've got here, uh, you can see the uh, where there's a sort of a, towards the sort of uh, top end, there's a sort of gap between the mountains. So on the, the top side, that gap just just down, um, sort of near that where that not small bright crater is, but for closer to the mountains, that's where Apollo fifteen landed, uh, near to the uh, uh, the Hadley Rill. So, so yeah, that's 
so another just, uh, excellent image of the moon it's really good isn't it so you got Sagar saying india are also sending up chandrayan to the moon so there's there's quite a lot of uh things happening coming up in, on the moon that's for sure hmm. You know, earlier on, we were, um, I think we, you said, Mark, that the, um, the moon um, is about four and a half billion years old. So it's uh, orb Did orbiting I? the Earth. I think you said something like that. Something when, like that. Um, when, uh, the, uh, when William Shatner went up into uh, Earth orbit, did he become the oldest object orbiting the Earth? Well, is, he is, is he... about four and a half billion years old. Yeah, so... I was kind of thinking that. No, he's the oldest astronaut. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he is about four and a half billion years old, so he could well have been close to the... Yeah. Even John, when, when John Glenn went up the second time, he was um, 78 or 79 years old, something like that. So William Shatner has really blown that record. Yes. But the man in the moon is by far the oldest sort of, uh, to be orbiting the Earth. So there we go. China's Chang'e 5 mission has sent back its first color photos. I do remember that. Um, I, I remember seeing that that in the news. So that's why I sort of hinted. I couldn't remember exactly what it was called, though. So thank you, Chris, for uh, clarifying that for us. They were from yeah. the other side, too, weren't they? Yeah, that was from the far side. Yeah. Far, the far to, side. Uh, yeah. I like to call it the dark side of the moon. It's so much more fun. It's so Pink <laughs> Floyd of you. <laughs> so Pink Floyd of me, I know. I can't help Only it. if you like Pink Floyd. Well, I do. Um, now, Barry <laughs> was mentioning something this afternoon at uh, the AC's instrument making section about the sun and the moon and the difference in brightness, which I thought was seriously interesting. And I'd love for Barry to uh, explain it to the viewers. If I can get it going. Oh, you're going to share your spread. Oh, wonderful. Cool. All right. That was that, a really good talk. It was, wasn't it? Here we go. It's a little bit of an inside running on what happens in section meetings that uh, yeah. some of these viewers don't get to see. So Barry gave a talk on the sun yeah. today, and there was a little bit of uh, discussion yeah, well, about the sun and the moon. So take it away, Barry. Well, good, good evening, everyone. Yeah, we were talking this afternoon about um, how, how we can go about photographing the sun and using um, telescopes with uncoated optics, reflectors with no coating on the on the glass to uh, to attenuate the light, and it, um, I brought up a couple of interesting facts that you may be interested in. Um, there's a picture of the sun, and in in, in astronomy we measure the brightness of objects uh, by what we call the magnitude. And the, ma the magnitude of the sun is recognized to be minus 26.7. Now, I know someone will write a question, how do you measure the magnitude of the sun? Well, it's, it's all to do with the um, gathering the energy at, um, all together and uh, with, with instruments that, uh, that, that measure such things. That's a picture of the moon. I've made it um, much the same size. If, was over the top of the sun, it would be an eclipse. But the magnitude of the moon is uh, at minus 12.7. Now, the difference being magnitude, being a, a difference of 14 magnitudes. In astronomy, the magnitude is a logarithmic scale. And it, um, if we consider a brightness difference of 100, then that corresponds to a magnitude difference of five. Right, mag where five magnitudes represent a difference in brightness of 100. So the question is, what brightness difference does one magnitude represent? And we can find that by finding the fifth root of, of 100. And that comes out to a figure of 2.512. Now that figure is telling me that if we have a, um, a star of magnitude 2, then a star of magnitude 1 will be 2.512 times brighter. If we, have a magnet, if we find a, a star of magnitude 3, then our first magnitude star would be 2.512 squared brighter than magnitude 3. 
So we can find out using that um, procedure just how much brighter the sun is than the moon. So in 14 magnitudes represents a brightness difference of 2.512 to the power of 14. That's the difference in magnitude. And that comes to 398,107. And putting it bluntly, we can say that the sun is 400,000 times brighter than the full moon. Mm. doesn't matter whether it's a super moon or not. The, br the full moon is quite bright. If you go out and have a look at it, you can read the paper by it and do all sorts of things. But the sun is 400,000 times brighter than the full moon. And the simple message is, don't look at the sun. Unless you've got some serious sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> so there yeah. you go. I, I thought it was... I just thought it was very interesting how much brighter the sun is than the moon. Um, yeah. yeah, considering how bright the moon can be to look at through an eyepiece of a telescope when it's a full moon, it is quite bright, and it's it's quite um, like you you lose your night vision very quickly looking at the moon, uh, a full moon, or in any even a, a, a like a quarter moon. You, it's very bright on the eye, yeah. and, and then to see that the sun is that much brighter. Um, <laughs> I think the problem is that people know that um, we can actually look at the sun with very special equipment. And the warning is that the, the equipment, it really is very special and that you shouldn't um, try and preempt what you can do um, without some very good advice on and what, what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, and uh, the, the consequence is that um, you'll, do have some very very serious eye damage if you if you um, I know this night is not about looking at the sun perhaps one day um, we, we can have a a session on, on looking at the sun but um, oh, we, we most just, definitely can yeah but I, just just sufficient for tonight to say it is incredibly dangerous don't look at the sun the sun is 400,000 times brighter than the full moon yeah um, and I think the other thing that explains barriers, it gives a good, a, a good representation of why the moon is so bright when it's a full moon. Yeah. Because it's got that much <laughs> impressive. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you for those stats. So we're going to have a quick look at Anne-Marie's full moon there. Oh, no, she's zoomed back in on the other one. Right, there we go. So I say full moon, but a full view of the moon while Noel skips across to... Mare, what they say was to I'll let him know, Mare, Figorus, and Imbrium. Um, so this is a nice view of what you would see outside right now if there were no clouds. And if you're in Bendigo or out near where Anne-Marie is, this is what you'd be seeing. If you're in Melbourne, um, according to Lee in Ringwood, you'd see nothing but cloud, which he's very grumpy about. <laughs> yep. Every time we do a live stream, it's cloudy in Ringwood. It's almost like it's trying to change something. Someone keeps buying gear. That's it's got to be that, at least. It has to be only in East Ringwood. East Ringwood, is, yeah. Well, is it cloudy where you are, Stu? You're only a stone's throw from me. Ah, uh, probably. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I've actually Marie... watched it forms over the top of us. <laughs> Amber has actually got Mare, Figoris and Imbri in the area that I was talking about up at the moment so we'll jump over to there. I think it's the area, I'm not sure uh, I'm just looking at Knowles off the side there and it's probably So Imbrius is the larger the, the yeah, larger so not one in the right area I think more of isn't it over there? We'll jump across to Knowles and then we'll see. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. There we go. So Knowles got it. It's got that lovely crater stuck in between the two of them. Uh, yeah. Towards the South Pole. Yes. So, yep. Steve, you'd like to take it away? The floor is yours again. I, I'm not sure I've got very much detail on... Uh... Uh, on any of this. I don't know if anyone else wants to uh, uh, chip in. I'm just trying to work out where where we are, actually. So what, what's the... Uh, uh, that's that, that's oh, Plato sorry. in the middle. Yeah, Plato oh, and uh, yeah. down to the lower right is the um, Alpine Valley. Take right. away, Barry. You've got 
any other stats you can add into that, that'd be great. Uh, Plato was around about the same size as, um, well, it's probably a little bit bigger than Copernicus, but it's a crater that is actually filled up. It's probably a very old crater and um, it is filled up with lava due to the collision that was probably ne just next door to it. Um, and if you look at the bottom of Plato, you can actually see uh, many craters, but you can, you can see them best under a certain um, elevation of the sun. If the sun is too, too oblique, um, they're not easy to see. Um, and that's one of the craters that I was referring to before. If you, you stand in the middle of, um, if you stand in the middle of Plato, then the rim of the crater is totally invisible due to the curvature of the moon. Yeah, so Plato is um, 3.84 billion years old, according to uh, Dr. Google. Um, so, it's younger, so it's younger than younger than Bill Shatner. <laughs> yeah. yes, yes, and it's 101 kilometers across. Uh, but you can, as as, as uh, Barry said, you can see it's a very old crater because it's it's full of lava. There's no detail at all. Uh, yeah. You can't see any of those sort of, uh, uh, particularly on the around the the crater edges. On a new crater, you would see uh, those sort of like um, ridges of the of the edges of the crater dropping down into the centre. There's none of that at all. It's uh, uh, it's 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 all well. It looks almost flat. It isn't almost flat, obviously. It kind of does almost look flat, doesn't it? Almost like it's about to overflow. Yeah. Mm. So I have a, have a couple of questions here for you guys. Bob wants to know if humans start using the moon as a base to launch rockets, will this slightly change your orbit distance? If so, is it anything to worry about? I'd be a bit concerned if we're putting rockets on the moon to start with, but uh, hypothetically speaking, would it cause an issue with the with the orbit of the moon? I think in a word, no. No, there we go. <laughs> No, the moon's a good place to launch rockets from because the gravity is only one sixth of the Earth, and uh, therefore it only requires a lot less, a lot less energy and a lot less fuel. I remember the uh, the light, the pictures that they showed of some of the Apollo missions. I think it was the later ones of just how you know when they push the push the go button to uh, to come back home, just how quickly uh, the uh, the top part of the lander actually. Uh, escapes. <laughs> so there was an interesting one that I, I'd like to answer by Raf. He wanted to know: Are there any plans for moon base? Raf, it's not a moon base; it's a space station. Sorry, a little bit of Star Wars in there. But there's one for the photographers out there. Chris wants to know: Is it true that to take a simple photo of the moon, you set exposure for bright day photo on Earth? ISO 100, one sixtieth of a second, f eight. Pretty much. Pretty much? Bang mm -hmm. on the money? Close. Close. What would you do, Anne-Marie? Something similar. <laughs> that doesn't. <laughs> something similar. What would well, you have the settings at? You could start there and then yeah. you would just uh, you would just change, um, if it's too dark, change, move your ISO up a bit. Um, you, at 1, 1, 6, 1 60th, it's, you're going to get a bit of um, camera shake, though. So yeah. a tripod would be good. Yep. Um, I could, I'd probably actually even make it about 125, 1 over 25, what, 125, um, rather than 160th. But you just play with the, play with them. F8 sounds about, about right. Yep. Well, there we go, Chris. Mm -hmm. Test it out and uh, yeah. start chuck, with that. And, yeah. Start with that and throw some of your examples on our Facebook page or send them to us in a message and we'll let you know how we think you've gone. Certainly could come down to the uh, the lens and the camera being used as well. Mm. So I'm just trying to see. We've got a couple other questions here. Uh, Nico, Plato doesn't have any smaller craters. So given the aging technique discussed before, it would be young rather than old. And I think we we're saying yeah, that's but, actually. Hang on, there, there, there are small craters in the bottom of Plato, but the big craters like Clavius, they've all been filled in with this lava. Yeah, so, so this was an old. It's possible crater. that it was a very, very old crater, and and some of the, a lot of the detail of it, 
the original Plato has been filled up with this lava lava lake. Then, then on top of that, there are small craters that you can see. As, as, as it is now, you can you, you can actually see craters on the surface of Plato. Yeah, I've got a um, I've got a very detailed picture of uh, Plato, and you can see there are a number of of small uh, uh, craters in across the, the the lake. But it is an interesting one. I mean, it's uh, Plato being a very old um, uh, crater, three point eight four billion years. It seems to have done remarkably well to escape being Im impacted by newer meteor meteors coming in and. Uh, um, as, as has happened with a lot of the other crises, particularly the older ones. So it's, uh, it seems to have escaped all of that. Yeah, I've got an image of it with lots of little craters in it as well. So Chris is coming back to the photography. So uh, I'm assuming he's got a phone that he wants to use and do that with. So um, that would be my area of expertise. And... <laughs> It's almost the same as what Anne Marie said. Uh, that would be close to where I would start with. Um, but I use a tripod when I take my photos of the moon with my phone, and I use a little Bluetooth clicker. So I don't have to worry about the shake that Anne Marie was talking about if you're hand hold, holding it. Um, but yeah, it's a matter of suck it and see. Give it a go, change the settings, um, kick the ISO up, drop it down, change, change settings, uh, lengths of exposure. I know when I'm using my telescope and I've got the phone attached to it, um, I drop the ISO right down to 50 because otherwise it comes out sometimes far too white. Um, so it's, it's a testing, it's just test, test, test. Just keep trying different settings. And you'll, with phones are very different to digital SLRs, that's for sure. Um, and every phone is different in how it has to be set up as well. Hopefully that was... Uh, ah, here we go, Nico. Are we looking at the moon right now in these images? Yes, this is live. This is actually the moon as it is being seen tonight, all the way from Cozy Bendigo. About uh, three seconds old. About three seconds old. Why is it three seconds old, Stuart? Because that's the, the uh, time it takes for the speed of light to reach the Earth. There we go. So we're looking back in time at the moon. By three seconds. It's pretty cool when you think about it. I think it's three seconds. <laughs> Is it live or filmed in your studio? Unfortunately, Stanley Kubrick couldn't be with us here tonight, so no, it's live. I think he might be in jail. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> we'll leave that one alone. I think what we've got, we've got we're on Lee's... Sorry, not Lee's. Um, Lee's got cloud, but he says it's clearing. We're on Knowles at the moment, and he's trying to get for us. Um, he's trying to get for us Aristarchus to come up. Uh, he's, he might be on the edge of the shadow, may not. So we'll see how he goes. See if he can get that for us. Um, so it's it's a lunar impact crater. In the northwest past part of the moon uh, near the side it's considered the brightest of the large formations on the lunar surface surface so it's quite an impressive crater and he's going to try and no it's hidden <laughs> so he's not going to be able to get it unfortunately oh, we're getting questions all over the shop about lunar um lunar landers or has a decision been made as to, yet as to where the next landing on the moon will be has anybody had any information come to hand on that one that they know of yeah not that i know of I, um yeah i don't know either no go, go jump back over so i don't know either i haven't heard anything unfortunately there's so many things happening at the moment it's very hard to keep up with everything that's going on that's for sure so what what people what, where they need to land, if they're going to stay there for any time, is they need to have water. So water can be broken up, as um, most people know, it's H2O, into oxygen and hydrogen. And um, 
if you land there and you can extract the water, that means you don't have to carry it because water is very heavy to uh, transport with a spacecraft, so it uses a lot of fuel. So if you can land somewhere and you know there's water there, you can use the water to drink and then you can also make rocket fuel and oxygen. So hang on. We're yeah, well, the, We're the, the, good, the good the news is... Sorry, Barry, go for it. You, you go. I was just going to say the good news is that there's thought to be water in the bottom of craters very close to the poles of the moon. But the bad news is that... Um, Getting astronauts in what, what is almost a polar orbit is not easy. It's a bit like Juno going around Jupiter. It was a very complicated um, uh, series of uh, rocket blasts to get into a polar orbit. So uh, landing astronauts near the poles of, of the moon will not be easy. No, that's so, right. We have another question. Can we also explain a bit about the moon's atmosphere, please? Or lack thereof? <laughs> yeah, I think it's almost non-existent. Almost. So when you say almost, is there any atmosphere on the moon at all? I've not seen anything written much about an atmosphere. I know that Mercury is said to have no atmosphere, but then it's been calculated to have an atmosphere of about um, a centimetre high. <laughs> which is almost ridiculous, but, um, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't I, think that if, if there is an atmosphere barrier, I, I think it's so thin that um, all the astronauts' footprints are expected to last for millions of years. Yeah. So just going back to um, the next landing on the moon, Lee, you've got some information on that that you'd like to share. Uh, yeah, it was just um, – hang on, am I unmuted this time? Yes, I am, because I was muted when you were answering that. Um, it's the, the next landing site, actually. It's been chosen by um, by NASA for the Viper mission, um, which is searching for um, for fuel because uh, or fuel components because, effectively, that's where water will be. Um, and that's the, the reason – a mountainous region near the Noble Crater or Noble Crater, um, and that'll be going in 2023. And there's oh, been so, um, various there's been various probes over the moon, and they purposely crash them into craters, and then they look using telescopes and other instruments to see if they can see hydrogen rising after the crash, and and yeah. that helps them determine whether there's water there or not. Correct. Yeah, so that's effectively oh, that's what they'll be doing. That's a very interesting apparently, thing. Uh, apparently Apollo, Apollo 17 did some experiments to uh, examine the uh, the atmosphere, and there are sort of whiffs of uh, mainly neon, helium, and hydrogen. But it's it is whiffs. It's uh, it's not a real atmosphere, if you like. It's a pretend atmosphere. <laughs> now we've got a question michelle wants to know let me see if we can get that up there we go what is the dark gray line at the bottom right of the moon now if it's what i think she's talking about which is the sort of it's one of the mario mario yeah. figuras and and that is there yeah, forgot mario figuras we were up we were zoomed up on there earlier with noel yeah. um when noel had zoomed in so that's mario figuras uh, which we were having a close look at before, and I've, I've got um, Noel's got a lovely little crater up for us at the moment. There it is, which is the Landsberg crater, which is not far from. Actually, there's two craters you can see in there. Uh, one's Reinhold, and the other one is Landsberg. Um, and Landsberg is a lunar impact crater, and it has a high rim and a central mountain, and the terraces along the inner walls and the tops have slumped to produce sharp edges. Now, Barry, did you have any information about Landsberg or Reinhold that you'd like to share? Or Not immediately. I'd have to look them up. Google is no, nothing, nothing off the top of my head. <laughs> nothing off the top of your head? No. 
But um, well, that's nice and bright there, no? That's on the edge of Murray Chrisium, is it? No, it is. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, we have another question about moon's atmosphere. Is the solar wind a wind that could blow dust around on the moon? No, I don't think. I wouldn't yeah. think so. It's no. an interesting question, but I don't it, think so. Yeah, it's a good question. It nice question. It it does have an effect on charged dust. On what so, dust? Charged dust. So um. Anything that's um, like when you get static, um, so charged particles that adhere to dust or dust adheres to, um, it could affect them. But I suppose if you're talking dust on the moon, it's a question of what's moved them around to cause any static. It, maybe whilst the um, if there's any anything that impacts, that would be um, uh, have a, a bit of a charge to it. Um, or when the um, the astronauts were there and moving things around, they would have caused static. But um, I think ordinarily not that much, and and probably in to insignificant portions. Hopefully that answers the question. Hmm. And the Earth is protected from solar wind by by our Van Allen belts because of our magnet magnetic uh, core. Mark? Yes. I have a, a small item of interest that the viewers may like to research themselves. Share away. Well, it's concerning what we call the full moon. Now, mm -hmm. the full moon as we know it, if we could go a long way north or south of uh, the Earth, um, is when the the sun and the earth and the moon lie in a straight line. And the next full moon, that, that of course is an instant in time. The next full moon is October the 21st at one hour, 57 minutes, 39 seconds. And that's when the lineup is, um, is, is straight to put it uh, in those terms. But there is another um, full moon that we, we well, when when the moon is full, of course, unless it's a total eclipse, um, it still shows a phase either north or south of the, on, on the limb. And um, a second full moon, which is very rarely referred to, is when the moon is maximum illumination. And that occurs probably at a slightly different time to what we not commonly call a full moon. Now, there's a, a third one of, of, that may interest some people. We work out the date of Easter as being the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox or, the, or, our, or our autonomal equinox. But it's not the full moon as we know it. It's called the ecclesiastic full moon. And it's a full moon based on religious uh, periods dating back hundreds of years. And as it turns out, I think it was in the 70s, it actually made a difference. It kicked the moon over uh, one month uh, from what we would have called our own astronomical full moon using the ecclesiastic full moon. Um, Easter was made a month later. So if people would like to um, research what the ecclesiastic full moon is, um, that, that would be um, a, an item of interest. Well, there we go. Bit of homework for our viewers. Go and do some research on what an ecclesiastic full moon is and come and report back to us. <laughs> it, it probably won't make a difference for another couple of thousand years, but in the 1970s, Easter was actually made a month later because of the ecclesiastic full moon. I think what we might do, Barry, is if anybody wants to go and research that and send us in their thoughts on it, I'll, uh, I'll copy and paste them and send them over to you for grading. Yeah. You, you can grade them. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll set an exam on it. 
<laughs> Here we go. Set an exam on it. Do your research. Barry's going to set an exam on it. Um, now we have what are the Sorry, what's what the that, image Stuart? we're what's the image we're looking at at the moment, uh, Mark? Uh, that's Knowles. Yeah. Knowles, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I finally found the um, Landsberg crater. So that's this guy oh. little here. Oh, okay. Yeah, the little one right it's, towards. towards yeah, that, they're pretty close to Copernicus. They um, are, yeah. Is this using, Noel, is this using your 180 millimeter Mac? It is, yep. Well spotted. Excellent stuff. Beautiful and sharp, isn't it? Mm, very sharp. Now, interesting question has just been posed. I find it amazing how the moon is transparent. During the day, you see blue sky right through it and around it, and during the, di the, the, the night, dark sky. Now, there is a reason that it looks like that, isn't there? That it looks like you can see through the moon. And I know what he's talking about. When you take a photo of the moon during the day, it kind of looks blue and not as bright. And that you can be... actually take images, Mark, of Venus and Jupiter. During the day um, as well. But, but during the day, what yeah. What, yeah. What, he's trying to, what he's trying to ask is, why does the moon look blue or almost look transparent during the day but not at night? So what causes that? And I, I would say it's to the fact that it's daytime, obviously, in the sun. I think it's um, atmospheric scatter. Atmospheric dispersion. I think it's scatter because during the day, the atmosphere scatters more blue light. Yeah. Um, and so there, therefore, it makes the moon look a bit transparent, but it really probably isn't. Yeah. So I've, I've taken photos of the moon um, in the late afternoon when it's looking that blue colour. And when you process them uh, and sharpen everything up, it, it just looks like a nighttime moon. Um, so, yeah, it's not that it's transparent at all. Um, and you can actually see Venus during the day if you know exactly where to look. Well, you can see Jupiter and Saturn as well. Yeah, with, with a telescope. But, with a telescope, uh, yes. From... Um, just naked eye, not only can you see uh, the, the moon, but you can see Venus. Not not easy, but you can. Okay, so I think Gerald wants to have a bit of a chat about eclipses. Just... Lunar eclipses or solar eclipses? Um, well, that's up to Gerald. He's hiding in the back end of the. Stream. No, I was sorry. I was um, I was thinking maybe we should talk about um eclipses because um you can actually get it's quite a quite a spe um spectacle to watch to watch the moon go from um from something that's quite narrow to something that's quite um amazing, nice and red. So, do any of you guys have any of your eclipse photos handy that we could share with the with the viewers and have a chat about it? Yeah, I've got some, but they're not exactly handy. Give me a couple of minutes, and I'll. <laughs> yeah, same. Give me. Well, Anne Marie's got one sitting on her desktop, so we'll just pop that one up and start be... with. Anne Marie, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you took this image of and what <laughs> eclipse it was? Uh, this was the moon eclipse. Um... I can't remember when it was. It was earlier this year. Um, this was. I just took a whole heap of shots, and this is just one that I happened to like, just right at the very end before it was total. So, um, yeah, it's just on my desktop because <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> when a lot of us were, when a lot of us were at Caulfield, we were at Caulfield, yes, and we actually had a yeah. great viewing that night. Just before lockdown five point zero. Yeah, March, March. Yeah, it was the day right. before. I've got a I've got a sad dad joke. Yeah. How, how does the man on the moon cut his hair? He how? clips it. Oh, he clips it. Oh. <laughs> oh no. Wow. That is a that's a granddad joke, that is. <laughs> that's almost Stuart. worse than most of mine. Mm. Stuart, would you like to explain a little bit about the two different types of eclipses that we've mentioned, solar and lunar? Um yeah, so um in the evening when we have 
lunar eclipses, which is almost yearly, is when the Earth passes between the sun and the moon. And uh, very slowly you see the uh, edge of the uh, Earth move across the moon uh, until it's uh, totally blocked. And then the moon turns red because it, it gets the reflection of the um, off the Earth back onto the moon. Uh, and it's mostly uh, in the red wavelengths. And so it looks quite red and, and, and until it then goes, starts to go back on, over the other side uh, out of eclipse. And then a solar eclipse is when um, the moon moves between, uh, comes around and blocks the sun. Hang on, I've just got to try and think here. It, uh, yeah, you're right. the earth, yeah, blocks the sun from, um, Yeah, the moon moves across and uh, slowly blocks the uh, yep. the sunlight. Yep. Yep, the sunlight, and until we we get the that um, one to two minutes total um, eclipse of the of the sun, and until it comes back out again. So that happens during the day, but the, a lunar eclipse happens in the evening or think, at, at night. At night. Am I right in thinking that we've got a uh, before the end of the year, we've got uh, a, um, a lunar eclipse or a sort of partial lunar eclipse and a partial solar eclipse coming up. Anyone know? I, th I think I was reading something in, in Sky and Telescope. I'm sure it's before the end of the year. Um, I've got a feeling it's a very low horizon one. Yeah, that's right. I think the, um, the, the if I remember the article, it said that because there's, um, there's a full solar eclipse which will be observed by many million penguins uh, in Antarctica. <laughs> um, I think that's what the article said. And we get a, a partial eclipse here in... Uh, I'm wondering if they'll have their telescope gear set up down there. <laughs> so it said many millions of penguins and a few hundred people. So that's the people based in, at the Antarctic stations. <laughs> now we've got a um, a video here from Caulfield from when we did our live stream of Caulfield. This is a live video that we captured on the night, um, well, that Lee captured on the night for us. And he's going to try and speed it up to show um, the eclipse. Going four times now, so still moving very slow. <laughs> no, we might have to go faster. That, that did sort of take an hour to occur. <laughs> uh, where are we speed? Hang on. There we go. Eight times. There we go. Can I go thirty-two times? I might Maybe have to. Yeah. <laughs> Did you did you take this at Caulfield, Lee? Yeah, this was Caulfield. This was actually using a um a HD a four K broadcast camera I used for videoing football. This is the one that we had streamed uh, on Facebook and YouTube. This is the footage that we were using. Yeah, it's actually coming up a little bit blocky because of running it at sixteen times. <laughs> so you can see it's about I, to hit there on the left hand side. Yeah, and it doesn't, when you look at it, in fact, it doesn't quite go 100%. So no, even it though it was a total. It. Yeah. It didn't, didn't, and, yeah. And and the other thing is you'll notice the moment it, it sort of gets to that point, though, we do, I did um, up the, the gain on it. Um, and not long after is when you then, you actually see Antares, I think, behind no. it. It looked look like we were going to eclipse Antares. Yeah, because yeah, uh, as eclipses go, it's a very short one, wasn't it? Because the moon was very close to the edge of the umbra. Correct. And it was interesting because it wasn't quite total. Yeah. So there was a shiny edge to the moon uh, during yeah. the whole during the whole event. Which we and you know, I did. I, I had this. This was actually, as I said, I had my. Um, so I had my. Um, telescope um and mount and everything set up 
And I don't think we actually went to uh, viewing through my telescope. We, this was all viewed on a um, – we had the uh, projector screen there for public viewers, um, and they were all watching this rather than what I had on the um, from the telescope. This was just from a, a video camera. So you can see Antares down the bottom there. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Was this the last in-person uh, that, was event in that we were able to do? Yeah, 26th of May. Yeah, yeah I can see the date on there. All right, 26th we, we of went May. In, we went into uh, uh, lockdown 5.0 the next day. Yeah. Mm. That's right. Which we came out of for a whole eight days and then went into the current one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so I think we've, um, unless anybody else has got anything else they'd like to share, oh, hang on, we'll just jump across to uh, Gerald's here. Oh, look at that. There we go. Have a look at that. That was, that was the other thing I was a little annoyed at. For the, like, we did everything we did, which was the streaming is fantastic. And yeah, we had Stefan there um, doing special comments, but I didn't get one photo during, <laughs> during the whole eclipse. And you yeah, can this, see it this wasn't, one, it was yeah. never quite total. Mm. Yeah, this one was taken the previous um, one. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same as you. The last eclipse we had, I I wasn't prepared for it. My gear failed yet again. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's a beautiful we did a, one. We did a lunar eclipse before then in the city on the Princess Bridge, and that, and that was a really good one. When was that? Twenty nineteen or was yes, that when uh, was that when the moon went a lot redder? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was a, yeah. that was a very good one. Yeah. So, oh, Anne Marie's got another one. So here we go. I think we've 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 finished with the live streaming of the moon. We're now reminiscing about lunar eclipses. Guess what? I've nearly got too. The moon. <laughs> and we're finishing the stream and, and uh Lee's finally got clear skies. <laughs> well yeah, almost. <laughs> uh well there you go. This is a beautiful shot. So you can see the full moon heading into eclipse and then coming out of eclipse. Um and I think that night at Caulfield the, it came out of full, fully out of eclipse and as it came fully out of eclipse the clouds finally came in and closed the night out for us, which was pretty Which was how it started. Before we it's even got there. Cloudy, clear, 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 clear. Yeah, the timing, timing was pretty perfect. We had a really good night. Indeed, night. Very perfect. I'm so yeah. looking forward to getting back to those kind of evenings. Oh, well, hmm. we're, we're nearly there. We're, what, a week and a half? We're just under two weeks away, week and a half away at this stage, two weeks away. Um, so we're not far off being able to go and do those sorts of things again. Um, so I just wanted to... Uh, before we finish up, just let everybody know that we have our Vic South live stream, um, which is the weekend we or days before we get full freedom and are able to travel um, throughout Victoria again. So we will be back for that. Um, it's a, a weekend extravaganza starting on Friday night with uh, Sky for the Night and uh, Lunar and Planetary, astrophotography on the Saturday, quiz on the Saturday, uh, discussion about or a presentation on comets. Uh, before we get into deep sky and then on the Sunday we're going to look at uh, solar eclipses and have a solar live stream uh, so we'll share the sun with you on on the Sunday of uh, the weekend after we can have weekend of cup weekend there you go so the weekend of freedom um, like Halloween Halloween weekend uh, Halloween weekend yes yeah. Halloween <laughs> weekend so we have so a raffle that one you. currently um, happening at the moment that raffle has two prizes. First prize is a Skywatcher Star Adventure mini kit valued at uh, $699. And second prize is a telescope carry bag. Um, it's, it's about 40 inches long. Uh, it's heavy duty and it's valued at $299. Uh, our raffle ticket links are on our Facebook page. Uh, if you'd like to grab a raffle ticket, all the money goes to um, our Pathways to the Planet project. Uh, and um, which is actually under construction at the moment, which is great. And we want to thank TSA Outdoors for sponsoring that particular stream tonight. I'd like to thank you for joining our live stream. Say thank you to Optic Central for sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, congratulations to our two winners. And uh, we hope to see you for our next <laughs> live stream. 
And if you're not a member yet or and you're interested in becoming a member, go to www.asv.org.au forward slash join. Uh, once again, if you don't follow us on Facebook, um, please do. And if you, follow, if you don't follow us on YouTube yet, yet hit the subscribe button. And we hope to see you in uh, a few weeks for our Vic South uh, live stream extravaganza. We'll no, what, no, what I want to know is can Gerald play us out with a tune? Can who play us out with a tune? <laughs> Gerald, is that the piano? Oh, oh, Gerald. oh, my God. Uh, uh, not connected. Yeah. All my stuff. Not all my stuff. Excuses, excuses. It's always the way. <laughs> Just nothing we'll get a copyright strike for. <laughs> we might get a copyright strike. Thank you to everyone for coming along tonight. Thank you to our, our uh, team ya. for joining us and helping us stream the moon and answer your questions. And we'll see you on uh, the weekend of freedom uh, or the weekend just mm. before freedom, uh, Halloween, for our live stream extravaganza. We'll see you later. Excellent. Thank you. See ya. Right. See ya.